I am very pleased to have with us tonight Dr. Jason Hine from the University of British Columbia up in Canada. The joy of virtual means we can bring people in from all over. Um, so Jason is an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of British Columbia. That's on the west coast of Canada, for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Canadian geography. Um, Jason received his Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry in 2000 and a PhD in Asymmetric Reaction Methodology, methodology in 2005 from the University of Manitoba under Professor Phil Halton. In 2006, he became an NSERC postdoctoral research fellow with Professor Barry Sharpless and Professor Valerie Falken at the Scripps Research Institute. And in 2010, he became a senior research associate with Professor Donna Blackman at the Scripps Research Institute. He began his independent career at the University of California Merced in 2011, employing in situ kinetic reaction analysis to rapidly profile and study complex networks of reactions. In 2015, he moved to UBC to continue the development of automated reaction analytical technology to serve mechanistic organic chemistry. His research has resulted in a collection of prototype modular robotic tools and integrated analytical hardware to create the first broadly applicable automated reaction profiling toolkit geared towards enabling autonomous research and discovery. He was the co-lead of Project, Project ADA, the world's first autonomous discovery platform for thin film materials, supported by Natural Resources Canada, co-PI of the Madness team, supported by the DARPA Accelerated Molecular Discovery Program, and an associate director of the Acceleration Consortium spearheaded by the University of Toronto and several other things which probably didn't fit in the biography or may have happened more recently. Um, so with that, I would like to welcome Jason um, to Houston virtually, and uh, I will turn the floor over to him. Thank you. Thanks very much, Don. And uh, thank you guys for having me today too. Uh, so today I've, I've just brought um, uh, a couple of topics to kind of go through, give you sort of a, a, a bit of an idea of the type of work that we're doing here and some of the ways we've been employing it. Uh, broadly speaking, in sort of the discussions we had earlier, I'm a physical organic chemist, despite what you may see in what we do. I am not an analytical chemist. I am not a computational scientist. I am not a, chem uh, a computer scientist. Um, <laughs> the tools that we build are in service of synthesis. And, and, and really, my, my sort of riff on what we do here <clears throat> comes down to again, from a rough sort of diagrammatic goal setting, where we stand now in terms of the ability to uh, deliver things, especially in the pharma space, um, the, the, the barrier is higher. What we're asked to do uh, has significantly in, in, uh, risen, and this is basically the bar we have to clear. Uh, at the same time, time pressure has, has, has contracted, right? So these are everything to do to uh, reducing R&D costs, uh, speed to actually sort of get things out, IP challenges. So we have to do a ton more with a lot less uh, time, energy, resources. And, and, and this, this is consistent across any industry at this point. We need to go faster. Um, the, the, the nice thing is we have a collection of, of hardware that's been ready accessible from a bunch of different areas that just needs to be recast um, in this sort of space. Uh, thinking back to kind of this year, one of the things I like to look at is, is Particular for my group, we're a highly interdisciplinary uh, team. We're not sort of focused on any one of these con uh, conventional sort of silos. And really the reason for that is because big things need uh, uh, creative solutions. So if you just look back to this last year, two major areas, uh, the global pandemic, um, and it's something that we were discussing actually just uh, before Obi. My, my advisor used to say that, you know, as synthetic chemists, we are the architects of matter. We get to decide how to build things. And, and if you look at uh, the challenges, the rapid sort of deployment of things like remdesivir and, and the mRNA, um, that comes together because of uh, uh, just amazing teams of people that, are, that have this interdisciplinary kind of core. Um, the, the challenges that circulate around uh, global climate changes um, really means that, again, materials and, and uh, chemistry is going to be at the forefront of that sort of as well. So these are things like uh, flexible solar cells and, and other kind of materials to help with means energy demands. So really to bring these pieces together, what we're talking about is we've got to do chemistry smarter, faster. Um, and ideally, from my perspective as a as sort of physical organic chemist, what that means is I need to understand what a reaction is doing in order to ask the question of if I'm making the right material or deploy it. And, and ideally, I want to have the reaction and then the guts, the, the sort of fingerprint of what's happening inside that reaction. That's the lens with which I sort of approach all of my problems, which is this, this time course analysis of what a chemical reaction is doing unlocks the ability of if I'm on the right track. The challenge is that direct coupling of reaction and outcome profile is, is, is not, it's not married. What we have here is that 
from, from understanding what's happening inside a reaction, you need the ability to sample that reaction in such a way that you don't perturb it. It has to be sort of passive. In the same time, you have to match all these hardware analytics so that you can do the measurement in a meaningful way that, that isn't a model to the reaction you actually care about. If you're doing a process type reaction, you have to be able to uh, see what's happening without, again, changing the chemistry or somehow changing the entire reaction that's not relevant to actually going forward with a, a manufacturing sort of lens. So what this means from the perspective of my lab is we combine many different uh, interdisciplinary teams. And, and specifically, we, we sort of bring these elements of custom automation, analytical chemistry, computer science, and process engineering together, uh, in addition to sort of our normal synthetic skill sets. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is, is number one, first of all, this is the amazing team pre-COVID, as you can tell, because of no masks, um, of, of the team that we used to have, that we have together. And it represents a lot of different disciplines uh, in the same lab. I think one of the things I really uh, uh, welcome and have been trying to foster is this kind of uh, environment where people from these very dis disparate kind of uh, backgrounds are, are, are fused together to come up with these creative solutions. Um, just to give you some highlights as well, I want to, uh, to point you to a couple of areas of publication that sort of go along this idea of both development of the hardware and its deployment to solve these kinds of problems. So I wanted to just sort of highlight a couple of our recent publications. A big thing that we are involved with, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of this deployment, is, is the ability to take at reaction technology sampling and couple it directly to things like uh, UHPLC so that we can do visualization of a reaction in real time by, um, by this HPLC kind of analysis. Um, one most recently is, is this paper in uh, ACS Catalysis, where we're able to marry uh, a reaction with a pyrophoric material in a glove box directly to online HPLC analysis for things like uh, not only mechanistic analysis, but also, again, control of that system in a dynamic way. Uh, second is sort of the philosophy, the modular tools that we build. Automation hardware and these, these automation part is, is the kind of the, the, the main toolkit we go to, to give uh, students, especially new students without these kind of hands and dexterity, the ability to do experiments far beyond their initial capability. And that's not just time, but that's also expertise and precision. So we like to onboard these, these, these pieces of automation. And, and we're not talking about something crazy like just a chem speed. These are very simple things like uh, programmable uh, hot plates, webcams. Um, they can be as simple things as just a, a syringe pump. And by unifying these together as these modules, you can create these much larger uh, sets. So in this case, in this iScience paper, we taught a, a collection of standard sort of pieces of, of laboratory equipment to do a measurement where it had to dose a powder, add amount of solvent, measure those two things, and make a decision of, did I dissolve this component or not by looking at a webcam? And it's the same kind of an aspect that you would do yourself if you were just trying to determine solubility, but it's, it's marrying together these different modules. So this is sort of a demonstration of how a simple if this, then that algorithm coupled to these kind of measurements could be deployed. Um, so Obi, this is specifically the, the JCAMET article I was talking about before. Right. Part of having all, this, the, having all of this uh, automation is cool, but if you can't use it, it is useless. So in this JCAMET article, what we wanted to do was actually show off how we can use people that are, especially the students that have grown up in the generation of the iPhone, you're used to being able to do simple things like voice commands. So we wanted to create, and in the response to the pandemic, an at distance lab for doing titration where you could talk to Siri and then actually control a, a, a simple titration experiment where you were looking via Zoom to say, oh, look, is, is my colors, you know, uh, what's the color of my titrant? I want to add solvent. I want to add uh, my next component. I want to reset the experiment. And it was a very simple way of having a live lab controlled with no programming interface. In fact, it was native language conversation with the, with the equipment. Um, and then last is, is kind of this accounts chemical research article. What we're trying to uh, emphasize here is that in addition to chemistry going faster with automation, data science is playing a larger and larger role as, as things like automation, machine learning, and, and, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence is starting to really uh, become a major piece of what we can do in terms of chemical research and discovery. Automation is the gateway though, because data is functionally what that, uh, that system eats, right? That is the, the, the digested feature of all of these kinds of parts and, and data science married to automation is a really important piece. So this is a sort of a context setting article where we're trying to show off how uh, the tools we're building are gonna be part of this larger ecosystem. 
Uh, last thing too is just another shout out because once again, we're, we're part of the pandemic now. So we've all become uh, YouTube stars. Uh, we do have uh, a YouTube channel. Uh, if you'd like to watch a little bit where we've been sort of deploying these things and, and, and the kinds of sort of things we like to do and show off at this point, please subscribe, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, what we're showing off in this particular demonstration is these are two six axis arms. These are not actually, because of Cobotic automation becoming more and more accessible, these are not super, super expensive anymore. The difference is these are completely disparate pieces of hardware. And what we're trying to demonstrate in this very cute Valentine's video is how we can take on the back end a simple scheduling software that allows those two arms to work together collaboratively to achieve a goal. In this particular one, one arm is asking the other arm out. That's what the students decided to sort of do as the demonstration. But, but again, behind here, this is really complex. Pick up a pen, go over here, do this check. But what we've been able to build is these kind of modular architectures for throwing something like this together is not that challenging anymore. And, and it means that now a student with this kind of lab can be very creative about the kinds of experiments they want to do, or again, even automate in that sort of capacity. So the first uh, sort of bit that I wanna talk about is, is, is applications in this online HPLC space. Uh, so depending on your background, HPLC, um, it, you'll recognize it's one of the, a very powerful piece of analytical technology. Uh, why we really focus on it is because unlike a lot of other sort of, at least from the organic chemistry space, uh, analytical hardware to watch what's happening, HPLC gives you resolution and quantification in, in a way that's, that's, that's unparalleled. There's almost no system that you can't find a, a solution phase, solid phase, injection component kind of combination that will give you some level of resolution and visibility without a massive amount of extra work. Like there are lots of other tools, but this is unique in its ability to have very large dynamic ranges and, and linear concentrations for profiles. So it's a very useful walk-up tool for profiling reactions. Um, why we focus on online is because if you take the, the, the question mark, of I have to sample the system, and then I have to make an aliquot, which represents a time point. So I've got to get the sampling and that, that time allocation absolutely right. That sample needs to freeze in time by the time I go to my LC and measure it, which could be a day later after the reaction is done. Things change and getting that both the aliquoting and sampling accurate is already hard enough barrier to then come up with an analytical routine that, that properly freezes that reaction with no other decomposition is another level of challenge that makes this, this very difficult. But by going to an online mode, what I mean is the sample is acquired, diluted, set to the HPLC, measured by the HPLC, all without sort of capturing the sample for later analysis. We, we marry those two sort of pieces. What this means is we get much finer uh, fidelity and also, again, from a walk-up perspective, you can look at a reaction by LC with very little overhead up front as opposed to all the other sort of analytical development you might have to build. Um, we've done a ton of hardware development. And again, I'm happy to sort of uh, share out sort of a literature body of if you're interested in this two point, I won't dwell on it, but going from a reaction to the LC, there is a million different sort of challenges, including things like air sensitive, pyrophoric, cryogenic, solid phase. Uh, and, and we've systematically worked through each of these kinds of uh, challenges and have solutions that sort of address them. So really, by this point, we have hardware solutions, which would, I would say, capture 80 to 90 percent of all sort of uh, classical organic reactions, even the challenging ones. Most recently was this uh, deployment where a fully inert atmosphere could be coupled in an online way. Uh, a core piece of how this works is actually uh, it's how the probe is sort of interfaced. Now, this is a piece of technology uh, developed by Metler Toledo. It's the probe part of it. What this probe does is allows us to, with an with a, uh, electronic motor, uh, extend this uh, sampling scoop passively. The sample enters that scoop, and we have the fluidic control in behind. So this is a sleeve valve. We draw that sample back inside the head, which allows us to then act on it. Now this could be quenched or any or dissolved at that point. And then that liquid uh, sort of phase is then passed on to the sample. So it's an accurate uh, volume based on its, its size, but more importantly, allows us to quench natively in the reaction environment. So if this was a grain yard at very low temperature, we can actually quench it in that very low temperature environment. Um, so it's, it's a very unique way to passively get into a reaction, address it, pull the aliquot, and then monitor what's happening. Just to kind of quickly talk through one place we've deployed this. This was uh, a challenge related to our, our ADA project. We had to uh, find out how to make this molecule here in the center, the spiroomatide. 
This is what's known as a whole transport material. It is an electron rich uh, conductive organic material whose job is to pass holes, positive charge to this perovskite solar cell. So it's a critical part of, of a multi-layer device. The problem is if you can't access it, you can't access it clearly and you can't synthesize it, then the whole sort of device chain falls apart. Not only that, understanding how to build this type of a molecule in terms of its mechanism, allows us to, to change that core molecule and, and change and tune its properties. So synthesizing this becomes a key challenge, doing it well. Now, what's interesting about the synthesis is, okay, it's just this very simple spirocyclic fluorine core with this electron rich periphery of these uh, polyaryl amines. Um, now we'd want to be able to go through and, and decorate, change these groups to other sort of either substitution patterns or other electronics. And these altered spiral cores, each of them is, is a sort of a different flavor in the materials community. They have different properties, they have different physical properties and, and conductive properties. So again, being able to sort of come up with a, a very clean route to systematically address these positions was, was really the key barrier here. So this is back to sort of a, a synthesis challenge. And again, it's not just purity and throughput. You need to be able to do this in, in a very large scale of application if you're ever gonna end up in a device. How it's currently done, one of the best case ways is to take this uh, tetrabrominated starting material and execute a buckwald hartwig uh, cn uh, cross-coupling. What it means is you've got to get four CN cross-couplings to happen around that periphery uh, very cleanly. Now, for anybody who's executed these CN cross-couplings, uh, if you don't get your ligand right, if your catalyst turnover is poor, then there can be issues of dehalogenation or, or, or sort of these kind of halted or rested uh, cross-coupling, which may mean that in this case, you could have uh, those failure events multiplied at every one of those sites. This can be a very ugly mix of byproducts if you don't get the cat uh, catalysis working cleanly. So we wanted to dive into this to look at it. Now, further challenging is uh, these are usually very air sensitive reactions using strong base. So, so being able to dive in and look at this reaction um, using something like HPLC was attractive, but, but challenging. And uh, again, if you just look at, imagine we've taken all the byproducts off the case. This is sort of the canonical what could happen if you were doing the coupling, right? We can do uh, the first coupling event followed by two possible regioisomers where we get that, that second coupling either on the same ring or opposite rings. Those are different regioisomers. Then we have a tricoupling and tetra. And again, we, we're, we're putting aside any of the sort of uh, other uh, byproducts such as deshalogenation and things like that. So it's already a very complicated potential intermediate. And understanding how it sort of moves through these cycles is what was key to, to really optimizing the kinetics and, and, and just getting the, the reaction to work cleanly. Um, so what we found though, was there's a really interesting phenomenon based into this. So although you can sort of abstract and say, I think each one of these CN events is a different uh, 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 reaction, right? So I'm gonna do an oxidative addition of my palladium uh, onto that site. I will then coordinate my amine. I will do my deprotonation and then a reductive elimination. That's one coupling event. But what's interesting is, is what we get is a process known as ring walking. If you notice this coordinated event here, this palladium coordinated on as the product here looks a lot like what would be the first intercept complex between palladium and your halide. So if you have a molecule with a contiguous pi system and another halogen on the other side, you can get what's called ring walking, where this dissociation event is, is, um, is capped off. The palladium simply slides across the ring to do a new oxidative addition event and then subsequent uh, repeats the cycle. So what this means is, if you control this event properly, you've suddenly taken that really complex, well, I've got four different halogens to work through, and you've actually reduced it to no, in fact, I just need to do um, along the same contiguous pi system, I need to do two, which will happen together, uh, CN cross couplings, followed by two additional ones. So by, by leveraging ring walking, you could actually start to reduce the number of ugly sort of possibilities if, if this was sort of a, a thing you could take advantage of. And, and in fact, what we found is this is actually possible. So going through early work where we started to look at with uh, tritubutyl phosphine under these sort of lithium HMBS conditions, Instead of having all those possible intermediates I talked about, the only two we ever visualize is we have our tetrabrominated starting material, we have our uh, intermediate, uh, this is the dye substituted one, and then the final product. So it actually cleanly went from the tetra material, two nitrogens go in, finally two nitrogens come out. And this was visualized by our HPLC trace. Most importantly is because we only have this uh, dye substituted one here, we knew we were getting this by mass, these two, 
But uh, actually growing the crystal structure proved that in fact, our, our hypothesis was correct. In fact, we're getting two substitutions across this fluorine system and no substitution across here. So it's not a fact where it's doing two and pause, it's, it's utilizing this kind of ring walking behavior in this way. So we wanted to leverage this further and understand it. Um, we wanted to be able to sort of go through and derivatize these things more and then look at this from a ligand perspective if it was possible to control it. So uh, what we found is uh, tightly coordinated uh, sort of Buckwell type groups, uh, the bulky sort of uh, uh, monodentate phosphines typically would uh, enhance this ring walking behavior. But if we went to something that was more like um, uh, Xanthos, a doubly coordinated or a bidentate one, we could actually turn this ring walking off again. So in this sort of case, what we're seeing is very clean aryl bromide, the tetrabromide star material going away. We start to form our mono, the mono becomes di. And in fact, isolation of this one proved that this di substitution, this mono di tri tetra, the di we actually favor here is actually the one on opposite sides of the ring. We're actually functionalizing across these two rings here, proving that what we're in is now in this environment where ring walking has been shut off. We're actually can have these two points. So again, the, the real punchline around this is, is this gave us the opportunity to ligand select for very complicated different behaviors, but not just that. We could now look at something system like this and say, if I want to select for this die opposite behavior, I now have a time course analysis, meaning I can actually starve the system and arrest it in this maxima and then uh, actually make these kind of more bespoke sort of systems. In particular, this die opposite is very interesting because by functionalizing across the rings here, you've actually desymmetrized. This is now an axially chiral material, which is now we're making it racemic, but it opens up the possibility to do programmatic synthesis of different materials in this sort of, in this sort of space. So switching gears a little bit, um, the other application we've done for online analysis sort of focuses more in the lithium battery space. So again, first normal question is, you know, why is a synthetic organic chemist playing with, uh, with lithium? Um, the reason, well, first of all, it is, it is a massive challenge, right? Being able to go through and do these kinds of uh, uh, isolation is a growing I issue as we start to address uh, sort of global energy uh, storage uh, capacities. And then with the rise of things like electric vehicles, this is becoming a, a pressured resource. Um, where, where I got involved in specifically, uh, comes down to uh, actually a uh, collaboration we're doing with uh, a local company here in Vancouver called Standard Lithium. Standard Lithium was interested and has made this direct extraction technology where uh, a plant actually in southern Arkansas uh, at a Lanxus facility is currently uh, working on a bromine process where they would pull up this lithium bromine rich material, they would extract the bromine and currently that tail brine would just be re-injected into the ground. And then through uh, a, a joint venture agreement, they created this new process where that tailing brine, now bromine lean, would be passed through their sorbent process to get a, a stripped material and then again returning back. It gives us a lithium chloride solution. Where I got involved was the question about how do you take this lithium chloride solution and turn it into something that you could make batteries out of was really functionally a crystallization problem. So it's this lithium conversion process here that was really the, the centerpiece of what I worked on. And why I was working on it is my background in process chemistry means I understand how to do the purification, crystallization, isolation part, albeit it's an inorganic material, but the fundamental rules are the same. So what our process looks like is kind of like this. We have sort of an input brine feed. This is what comes from the direct extraction technology. We carry out a softening. This is this close to synthesis that we're doing here. We're just carbonating the material to actually produce this lithium carbonate solution. This now has a different KSP, so we have uh, the ability to crystallize this material, and we carry it through this dynamic continuous crystallization using a temperature differential between the two. Interesting thing about lithium car uh, carbonate is it actually has an inverse solubility. At high temperature, it crystallizes, unlike most materials which would dissolve at those higher temperatures. So in fact, you, by controlling this process like this, you could bring a lithium carbonate solution uh, as a slurry or an impure material into this cold reactor, carry out this uh, dynamic uh, 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 circulation process where the crystals are generated under controlled environment in our hot reactor, which are then isolated by the filter press. Uh, key to this, and again, this is what, what makes uh, my, my involvement in this uh, uh, relevant. We use the same way that we do for any process is we bolt on online analysis to see what's happening and thus control the process to get it on, on base right the first time. 
We use a combination of in-situ microscopy and ion chromatography, which is just the same cousin as, as high-pressure liquid chromatography. So we can tell the composition, concentration, and rate of crystallization of the process live by using these sorts of tools. So what this meant is what would normally be the process where you take lithium chloride into lithium carbonate involves this multi-step kind of thing where you do uh, first processing to get a much, much cleaner lithium chloride solution. Uh, there's actually a lithium carbonation step, which is similar to what we do, this pressurized CO2 extraction via bicarbonate and then onto it. So this is a multi-step process, which is very, uh, honestly, very energy and material intensive. We just simply drop that flow sheet where our same in, uh, in pure lithium brine goes through simple carbonation, recrystallization, and then same level of purities as we're getting from these OEM type vendors. Now, why this is a challenging issue as far as a crystal? Uh, first of all, the, the inverse solubility is weird. You know, having materials that sort of behave this way is one part, but the biggest thing is it's actually a very uh, relatively uh, shallow solubility curve. The difference in solubility between very cold and very hot is not enough to do this as a simple batch crystallization and hope to get uh, good mass recoveries uh, from a, like a fully soluble to a fully insoluble material. Um, the other one too is that the concentration of brine is input, it varies a little bit. So you actually have to tune the process from that first part to make sure that you're matching your crystallization uh, dynamically. So this is where it has to be able to know what it's doing in order to, to again, use these kinds of uh, process regulation. What is in there also changes. So what happens here, in fact, lithium carbonate, it's not just simply its temperature-based solubility. Other ions in there will change its concentration at solubility limits. So in fact, if you start with pure or just lithium carbonate and start adding sodium chloride to it, you end up with a, a soluble material where up to uh, 1.5 times as much material can start to dissolve uh, as you start to add other uh, dissolved ions. So, so getting this composition right of where you are, not just lithium concentration, but other ions is exact, is really, really, really important. So in fact, we usually sit sort of in the one place, but it's a larger playing grid too. In terms of crystallization, uh, for people that have run this before, control is key. And how you have to do this is if you just take a, a lithium solution, you try to do your crystallization, it's a relatively beast of a crystal where what it loves to do is agglomerate. It, it, it forms together and, tight, and tightly grabs whatever's in the solution phase. And this is what leads to uh, a large amount of, of impurities. And, and coupled to that mass recovery problem, I said, this is why batch crystallization becomes challenging for just for this material. You have to go through these, these uh, much more dynamically controlled processes in order to get this high purity material. Uh, so just visualizing it by the in-situ microscope, this is one of the ways we can tell if we're on base or not. So if you just go through a standard uh, crystallization, this is kind of visually what we see is these puff balls, these dense cores with these spires. And that's what we, we, we uh, can tell is, is, is a highly agglomerated and impure material. Versus if we do the proper control of crystallization, we end up with these uh, relatively long aspect needles. Filtering is easier with them, but also we have these exposed surface areas. So we don't end up with, uh, with uh, inclusions like this. Again, how we able to dial this part in completely comes down to having our IN chromatography as our as sort of a guide on this point. We understand what we need to do in terms of how the process is behaving. And, and again, it's variable. We're taking a geological material here, so it's not uh, as, as reliable as, as a batch from a, uh, uh, an actual sort of source or a vendor. We have to deal with whatever's coming up in, as, a, as a component by component basis. Uh, so just generally speaking, what we've done now is the, the different stages, uh, just to show you sort of that the, the thing is live. We have our initial brine uh, material. The softening tank itself is, is, is this sort of skid where we carry through our carbonation. We have the technology built into it. We can actually uh, measure what uh, the lithium concentration is so we can do the carbonation as a as response to what's coming into the sort of the feed. We have our uh, crystallization reactors where we're using sort of this in situ bag filtration, but also a ceramic membrane, which gives us our, our separation on, on the cold side. And then uh, a duplicate to this kind of one is actually over on the hot side where the crystals are growing in this, uh, this hot reactor. And then once again, being filtered against the ceramic membrane uh, chain to get us our isolated uh, compounds. Those are then carried through uh, from a thickened slurry into our filter press, which are then washed and dried to give us our, our, our final material. So this is actually um, a first run that we did um, on, a, on the plant uh, during qualification here in, uh, in Vancouver at a company called Saltworks. They were our industrial vendors that helped to build this up. And there's, there's something like, it's fun being a synthetic chemist to come out and say like, here, we finished this material. 
This was stuff that was in the ground that came out as 99.97. So an isolation extraction point of view is a, is a really different sort of sense. And again, students stuff working on this. This is really cool. This is a really interesting sort of uh, thing to be part of. So uh, really, uh, just to sort of to, to touch and end on this too, we now have this, uh, this capability. Oops. We now have this capability to sort of carry through multiple sort of feedstocks on, on, on relatively large scale. We've qualified this out as a, a 15 kilograms sort of batch at a time type skin. And this plant has now moved down to, to Arkansas to the actual live, uh, live site. And we're carrying through uh, the development in that space now too. So the last thing I want to sort of discuss through is, is, is now bringing these pieces together. Online analysis coupled to what would be sort of PID control means that we can build these relatively strange processes and have the, the reactor sort of correct itself. But to do the next level up of actually sort of use this automation in the space of sort of uh, discovery means bolting together uh, an autonomous system, something that has the ability to do decision making on the fly towards some larger goal. Now that could be an optimization or that could be discovery of, of new materials. So the question, and this, this is what we kicked off in terms of what we called Project Ada. Project Ada was focused around this idea of like, could we take the canonical discovery cycle and build a hybrid system of human robot interaction? Um, what's different about this kind of philosophy when we started off is we were trying to create what was nascently termed as a self-driving lab. It's this, this bottom part of this Venn diagram is what we're trying to target down here. Now, the, the, the basic uh, sort of thesis here was that, look, uh, manual experimentation um, has some issues in terms of, uh, of reproducibility, relatively slow experimental throughput. But the nice thing is it's highly flexible. If you want to change what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just a matter of a different lab kit, but, but that's completely mutable. Um, on the high throughput experimentation side, that addresses the issue of more data. The downside is it's a relatively narrow focus in terms of the kinds of experiments you're doing. And then for people that have played in things like the material science or the, even the, um, the medicinal chemistry world, you, you know, we, there's conversations we've had around basically everything looks like an amide coupling or Suzuki. And that's just because those are the types of reactions that are very highly guided towards these HTTP platforms. So some new discovery and hit lead generation typically falls within that sort of part. So, so it's, it's, it's exceptionally vast, but highly restrictive in terms of the kinds of reactions you might do. So we're trying to target sort of the best of both worlds, something that would uh, allow for more high throughput, but also uh, more frequent learning, but also in this more uh, automated way that an algorithm could basically sit at the center of this and kind of guide it. So this would be a low number generation, learn from one or two experiments, predict and plan the next series of experiments. Again, no human in the loop. So this is a, a larger sort of conversation that we've had. Uh, I direct you to this article in um, uh, Chem and Inge News by one of my uh, collaborators, Alan Asper Guzik. He was, uh, he was interviewed through this part talking about these AI-directed autonomous labs and, and how really this is not total science fiction. This is something that's becoming pervasive. So using what would be normal PID type control, now onboarding AI and machine learning, this, this is becoming slightly more commonplace. And, and as we start to see this, uh, and AI's role sort of uh, growing in this space, we're gonna see it more and more. So this became a question of, okay, if you have these highly bespoke systems, how could you build a system generically for, for any application? Because uh, some of the, these tools that come together right now are sort of the, 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 the product of multi-year massive center kind of pushes and needs something that's much more deployable using an ideally commercially available kind of hardware. Uh, Project Data was a one step earlier than that, still very bespoke, but it was focused on this idea of could we use an autonomous system to design a thin film material for an energy application? This goes back to our, our flexible solar cell kind of points. Um, the, the publication we did on this was in Science Advances in 2020, and it, it's, it, it was a, a success in the sense that we were able to do both compositional and formulaic manipulation around what would be a thin film kind of application. And it means that you can take a very large experimental set, something larger than you'd ever try to address with something like DOE, and give it to the system and ask it, look, you have a goal, you are the, 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 the things that you can change, and I want you to identify some series of, of, of properties which are within the scope of what I'm asking you to do. This is, this is a merger between analysis, execution, and synthesis uh, with, with an AI algorithm to sort of drive it. So really, again, to sort of, if, if this is an area that you're not super familiar with, uh, a couple of papers that I want to kind of highlight as, as kind of background reading. Uh, first of all, if you're interested in machine learning and its role in synthesis, there's this article uh, by Frank Glorious in his group 
a fantastic and again beautiful tongue in cheek uh, tongue in cheek uh, machine learning the ropes great article to sort of show you about the kinds of uh, methods that are available and how they can be deployed. Uh, this, this paper here by uh, Tiago, uh, Adaptive Automation and Optimization. So what this is starting to do is say that if you have these really big multifunctional data sets, how can you use an algorithm to help you uh, really a lower experimental budget for these kinds of applications? And this is not just sort of variables like temperature and concentration, <clears throat> but it's actually being emergent where you're asking things like what ligand? What metal, what solvent, which would be, which are much more difficult to sort of qualify against using things like uh, multivariate optimization and statistics. Uh, there's this paper by Abby Doyle uh, in Nature uh, earlier last year, where she's uh, really deploying uh, this first sort of whole data science toolkit for Bayesian reaction optimization. Now, what's really cool about this particular paper is uh, she has a fully downloadable package for if you're interested in, in sort of applying this kind of point, this package is meant to be uh, a sort of a synthesis guide for, for synthetic chemists. It's, it's meant to be a, a sort of the backend ML is mostly uh, handled to allow it to be deployable to the masses. So if you're, if you're entry into this, this is a great place to start if you want to sort of try these things out for yourself. And then finally, um, this community perspective is, is something by a number of luminaries in the field, uh, especially from the, the, the sort of the ML and automation community, in particular, uh, Benji Muriyama. He's one of the first uh, people to kind of come up with this idea that this fusion has uh, um, enormous value. In, in fact, his, uh, his ARI system, the Army Air Force, uh, the Air Force Research Lab, was one of these tools that figured out how to control the growth of carbon nanotubes using a really, really large experimental space. It's, it's the kind of thing that would take years of progressive automation or, and, and, and experimentation, uh, but by having this kind of a toolkit on it, they can actually rapidly uh, move through and, and profile the space much, much quicker. So the deployment we wanted to do, back to this concept of for synthesis, we want something that can do the normal scientific method using ideally uh, more commercially accessible kind of parts. Now this is still relatively high level and we're working our way back to uh, what would be uh, uh, fully deployable in any sense. Now any scientific process is going to have really three kind of areas. You have your hypothesis generation, your execution and experimentation, and your observation and planning, right? These are your three basic components that you have to carry out. So when we said we're going to build up a platform, you need to come up with something that's going to fit these three roles in, in a, a larger capacity. So what we decided to do is reduce this down and say, okay, we're going to have our hypothesis, our experiment and observation. We call these our schedule, execute, and analyze, right? So this is these three, because what these do is they map over things that we've seen around the lab. Execute, this means some kind of, of toolkit where you can program a series of chemical steps, dose, stir, uh, uh, which material, what temperature, what time, right? So these are standard automation toolkits, and that's everything from as we've showed with the solubility argument, that could be low level, like a hot plate and a webcam, or very high level, it can be something like a chem speed or an automated ro a robot mess sort of place. Analyze, again, it has to be something that does a measurement on your system. Now for synthesis, what this typically means, again, is something like HP HPLC or React IR, but, but even then a lower level, uh, you can do simple things like webcam capture of a TLC plate to say, again, decision-making, is this reaction done or not? So there's, there's anything in that point where a piece of information from the reaction must somehow feed back into the algorithm. The schedule part has to be some kind of ML algorithm. And again, as I sort of showed you in those four papers, these are becoming much more accessible in the community. These are things that you do not need to be um, uh, a, a very dyed in the wool data scientist. They are starting to become tools that are available as, as packages for experimental planning. There's several that are out there. We chose to use uh, the uh, a collaboration with um, our, our collaborator, uh, Alana Spurguzic, University of Toronto, where his ML algorithm in particular, uh, the Griffin algorithm, which is also again, publicly accessible, was our sort of our engine for this from an experimental planning point of view. So this was a project uh, in collaboration with Merck uh, done by uh, this fantastic graduate student, uh, uh, Melody Christensen. I'm happy to say that this uh, this work is now uh, fully accepted now in, in chemical communications, which is a, a new open access journal uh, with Nature Publishing Group. So what we wanted to do was to take on this idea of experimental planning. And again, what was really different about what we were trying to do instead of what was out in that space is that um, these other kind of tools were primarily based on flow chemistry 
uh, and, and, and sort of a continuous process. Now, while that's really complex, the challenge there is um, you're bringing the material reaction relatively small scale. It's easy to manipulate continuous variables in a continuous uh, way, like you're just changing uh, flow rates. Uh, and also the sample ends up at the, re the analysis. It's, it's already on its way to an inline analytic. <laughs> Most chemistry, in terms of a screening perspective, is batch. It is done in vials iteratively at a time, and so it means rebuilding this kind of architecture for this batch point was, was a really, really high kind of goal. So that's, that's why we sort of took on this part. As a, as a test, we wanted to take on a very simple Suzuki reaction. So this is using a vinyl tosylate and a boronic acid. Where the goal here is we wanted to actually have this undergo what was called a stereo retentive Suzuki coupler, where the position of this tosylate is, we wanna replace that with our arrow groove. Uh, and, and again, it goes by what would be sort of the canonical sort of C, uh, CC coupling. This is an oxidative addition, uh, aerylation, metallation, then reductive elimination kind of pathway. Now, this is a really, really hard thing for this molecule because we've got this donor group over here, this uh, carbonyl, really, really, really likes to uh, actually favor a stereo inversion pathway. These kinds of systems, if you treat them with palladium, it actually goes by way of, of, a, of a binding event, where even if you go in with, with a non-perfect ligand, it likes to go through this kind of enolate intermediate binding here, which actually twists the system around and actually will, will, uh, will, um, will ruin this sort of stereo retentive point of view. So not only did we have a challenge of we needed to come up with uh, optimized conditions to get you one product, so high yield, we have the selectivity issue where the entire system is actually biased to go the wrong way. The electronics and everything else is really, really pushing you towards inversion, and we want to go retention. So we're actually asking the system to actually walk uphill away from what a thermodynamic minimum would look like. So it's a, it's a relatively big challenge. To sort of scope this out, we said, look, the knobs were going to change. We're going to have these 12 ligands, we're going to have a palladium to phosphorus ratio. We're going to have a palladium loading. Uh, we're going to change the aeroboronic acid equivalents, and we're going to manipulate reaction temperature. So we have a series of both contiguous variables. These are sorry, are continuous variables, things that have numerical coefficients. But we also have categorical variables. These are ligand. Ligand does not have a numerical value directly associated with it. And we wanted the ML algorithm to be able to treat that sort of space too. What was hard is we wanted to, not just to say, okay, play with these numbers. We want you to maximize the yield of our E product, but we, at the same time, minimize Z, minimize palladium use, minimize aeroboronic acids. So we're asking you to do a multi-objective optimization and weigh these different things. So not only get the product we want, but you're not allowed to overuse palladium. You're not allowed to overuse starting material. You need to find the kind of this, this, this best, this kind of Goldilocks kind of scenario where there's a good and, and bad sort of level setting. Um, what this meant is we actually have to carry through again in batch several optimized loops of batches at a time where it has to manipulate and, and weight, weight these different variables. Now, how it's doing this on the back end is, is by what's known as a Bayesian uh, optimization. If you imagine graphically that the function, the things we're changing, which are those temperature, ligand, whatever, and the response surface, why yield goes up or down, is some unknown function. We're representing it here with just kind of this wiggly line. What we'll do is we'll carry out a series of measurements randomly associated over that experimental space. Now, what that does is there's a Gaussian process. The, the backend math will go through and say, well, based on these, here is an estimation. This is what I think is actually uh, why the responding variables change the way they do according to our multivariate manipulated variables. Now, obviously it's bound at these points where the experiment happened, we have high certainty. What we have is these regions that defines these high uncertainty. We don't know exactly what's the right answer in this middle space between two experiments. So what we create here is not just these, this hypothetical guess, but it creates these regions where we say, I know what's happening versus I really don't know what's happening versus I really, really am uncertain over here. And that helps us guide where we want to do our new experiment. We can have a choice here. The algorithm can either say, you know what? I need to know more about this point. I'm really uncertain here. So I want you to do an experiment here to help bind the equation. That's what's known as a curiosity-driven algorithm. It's exploring in these regions. And that's useful. But again, if you have a completely exploratory one, you'd spend all of your time looking at new data and never really get anywhere. So that's not perfect to be completely exploratory. 
On the other end, you can exploit. You can look at a region right here and say, you know what, it's pretty good. And I think the gradient here is pretty good. So I'm gonna keep going this way. Again, valuable, but the, the downside about that algorithm is you can trick it into local minima or local maxima. It can, can too quickly make a decision about that's probably the best, I'm gonna optimize there and it will miss a global maxima somewhere else. So the key thing about things like the algorithm that uh, Alan Asperguzic has, has, has made is it's dynamically weighing these two parts. It's explorative up front and then gradually becomes more exploitative as the reaction sort of uh, goes through. So using this one, what I can happily say is that this is a, a tableau vision of what we've kind of, uh, of kind of done here. And again, it's, it's an ugly graph, but we have yet to figure out how to sort of visualize 10 dimensional space easily. All we're trying to represent is we have multiple ligands that the system ran. We have sorted them in terms of the, which ligand and how they performed. And what you get from this is L7 seems to be performing very well. It actually has the highest yields of our E product, but more importantly, what we're sort of showing down here are the conditions associated, the temperature, aerobronic acid equivalence, palladium ratio that associate with each of those two. So there's a little bit of extrapolative behavior we can pull out. But what we get from this is within the same number of experiments, which would be normally like a two plate kind of optimization, it went through, surveyed, sampled, decided that L7 was better than the others, and then spent more of its time testing and optimizing L, that, that ligand after it sort of down selected these others. So it's, it, it's, it's properly guided through this point. Now, what was really cool about this is it found conditions better than rounds of HTE. And more importantly, again, with no knowledge up front, we didn't have to teach it what ligand did what. It was able to sort of uh, to, to go through, do these level settings, the control experiments, and then guide itself to, to where it should be spending its time. So this is a, a relatively uh, interesting sort of success. And we've carried this part through uh, a number of rounds of kind of optimization. Again, happy to talk about these things in a little bit more detail, but really, again, I want to to give you a, a broad survey of the kinds of things we're doing through in these different stages, right? Automation hardware development means that we can go faster in this fully empowered kind of way. Taking those and pushing those onto problems like our lithium recovery means that we have the ability to use these industry tools towards a, a delivered large scale goal, in this case, a, a pilot plan. And finally, taking that analysis, the way we think about using these things with their data science piece means we have the ability to build these platforms that can take care of these lower level optimizations. Again, no, no person in the loop. Really wanna thank you guys for, for the opportunity to sort of talk through today. I'm happy to have uh, any other discussion, conversation, questions. Um, I can't do this without my amazing team. We have a, a much different face set, but similar kind of a, a makeup than we did before. And um, I'm, I'm absolutely indebted to, to having these guys and, and our sponsors in that point. So again, really, really thank you guys. Thank you, Don, for, for having me up today. And I'm happy to stick around for discussion questions. Thank you, Jason. That was incredibly interesting. And thank you for spending um, time with us today. So the floor is now open for questions. Um, you can either place them in chat or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask them out loud. If no one else is going to jump in. Um, I know with the, the lithium one, you're seeing a lot of deployment and pharma. Are there other areas that you're seeing a lot of application for this that you personally, not just in general? For your yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the specifically with reference to sort of the ML guided stuff, the best problem you can possibly think of is something where the initial potential is so vast that you would either spend so much time searching the dark corners or you would do what we normally do. You triage experimental space back to what you think is most likely. Now, why that's a danger, right, is you employ, you, you put your first swath of bias based on probably what you can find in the literature and you actively say, I will not run experiments which have low chances of success, which can, can really limit you. And what that means is you keep walking the same canonical thing. So in pharma, that's usually what's above or below the arrow. And, and, and even that's a bit bound problem. Where this is really big is, is in, the, in the materials uh, development, the number of possible parameters in terms of not just what's in the material, how much you have, order of addition, uh, the, the, the processing of that material, the macroscopic things at different length scales, the, the, the challenge, the, the dimensions explode. So this is where 
applying a tool like this where the, 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 potent, the possibility of search is so large that coming up with what you think the rubric of, of your design is can be staggering. You know, I think that that's, that's where it has its, its, its biggest sort of immediate bite is something that a design of experiments type reduction will not do well if there are too vast in terms of the number of parameters you want to sort of do it first, right? And I know I've, I've run into applications where it's like, I think I want to use a design of experiment set, but turns out some of the things you're doing are, or your parameters are, responses are, as you say, with a ligand, it's not something that you can map onto a numerical axis. Exactly, exactly. And that's where there are problems for things that you need to pick because it's like, well, I can't chart this because it doesn't have a numerical value. It's like, blue versus red versus something else, but it's not a spectrum that you can go A to Z. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, I think, where there's a big set here. And this can either be used in that early scoping kind of exercise or again, refinement of, of, of other parts too. One of the values things too is that, again, if you, if you have the right analytical, not just single experiment, multiple experiments, um, you can actually do a pretty good job of taking the same data set and, and layering a cost function, something that you say what, you know, it could be as much as I want high yield, but also this property, but also this IP space, right? There's ways of sort of guiding it where you're saying, I, I, I want these kinds of returns and other. Think of it as like a really awesome SciFinder search, right? A little bit more, I guess, space intensive on your bench top. True, true. <laughs> I had a huh? quick question. Um, yes. Those, um, ligands that you were working with for the Buchwald-Hartwig uh, amination reactions. Yeah. Um, polycyclic um, aminated structures, uh, highly electron rich. I was wondering whether there was any potential for carcinogenicity uh, for ligands of that sort. Uh, sorry, any, any potential for what, sorry? Carcinogenicity. Um, ah, yeah. Electron rich systems activated with amines um, have dangers in that direction. A absolutely. The, the one reason why these kinds of compounds, uh, as, as, uh, as dopants, have actually sort of risen up is, is most of them are uh, very, they, they do not form glasses and they are not fully planar, right? The spirocyclic core to them gives, you're right, they start to look a lot like a like a, an estrogen receptor kind of analog, right? No, uh, no. Like tamoxifen kind of bit. Um, but uh, the, the the goal with this is to is to is to say that, that they actually need to be created as this twist structure that is electron rich, but also not intercalated, right? That's that that is I think part of the design element. I know I'm talking about structures that are prone to uh, you know sort of oxidation and um, and then you know uh, alkylation. You know, so oh, okay. like phenanthrene is not carcinogenetic. I mean, onaphthalene is. Right. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't know uh, what the the full bio uh, the bio of uh, liabilities of these have been tested, but you're right because they are such electron rich species. They're very quick radical cation uh, sort of species, right? I'm just thinking about the safety of um, lab staff. Might be something to investigate might be known in the literature but yeah absolutely yeah. and that that is again back to one in the in, in the in the camp of, of some of our hardware right one of the things we we do prioritize around using these sorts of things is it it puts the chemist what there's there's another layer of ppe in place right the execution is being done by our six axis arm not necessarily grad student mm. so this does have some applications into some of those uh, uh sort of uh high potency compound uh, sort of synthesis and development uh, points too. Sometimes where you need these kinds of points, but you do want to be a uh, uh, level set against that. I guess that plays in a bit when you're talking about dealing with pyrophorics as well, as I know that's always a, a continuing to be a concern, especially in academic situations, but definitely yeah. on larger industrial scale, if you're using those sorts of things and be able to conduct this sort of uh, experimentation with people out of the danger zone. Yeah, well, it's not even just distance point, right? That it's a lot easier to take a, a cobotic arm and put it in a large nitrogen filled room than a graduate student. Um, so there, there is there is well some, in that now. Less so, but but you know there there is a bit. 
I'm just thinking about a, um, a chemist uh, who's running a group um, um, who was interested in looking at a frog skin secretion, which was reported in the literature to have some interesting properties. So the first total synthesis was done by this staff member. And um, when they tried out the pharmacology to, to see if it was an analgesic, as reported in the literature, um, every dose down to very sub-micron, micro um, gram amounts, uh, the mice immediately um, had a you know spasm and died, um, and so <laughs> it was very lucky that he had good technique. <laughs> it wasn't anything it wasn't anything like what was reported in the literature <laughs> when you made it pure. Yeah, but, I, it, sorry, not the sorry, sort of thing you want to be. <laughs> want to find out the hard way. Well, as again, it's as 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 a supernicotinic, um, like a supernicotinic agonist turned out to be. As as an impurity too. Well, it, what's really so swapping uh, war stories? I, my my graduate project, and Don may remember this, was to work with um, various effectively. Uh, I was making oxazolamides for chiral synthesis, and what that meant is actually making materials that were close to ephedrine analog, except way more lip lipophilic. So yeah, one day of bad lab technique meant that you were really, it was like the, like 50 cups of coffee for three days. You're, oh, these are not the types of things that you want to find out as, as, as first in human trial, right? So yeah, the, 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 I, I do advocate for these kinds of things. Again, I do see the technology as a major part of this two point because it is one more layer of PPE, but it does require things to get a lot more um, stable. One of the other parts too is like, I have a, a pretty bad mess up on my finger because one day a automated liquid handler, which I had removed the stop if you think you run into something sensitivity, decided to pierce my finger as if they set them. So, you know, they're, they're, the, the other side of this too is that everything must be done with, with the, uh, you, you take care of some cares and then you, you add all sorts of other problems too. Robots are just as easy trying to take us over. Well, I'll say that one certainly um, on the industrial side of things is usually, I don't want to say better, but certainly there is a lot more guidelines in place with lockout takeout procedures and not removing safety precautions, which I know oh, for sure. I think everyone has had their uh, worst stories from grad school or some of the less tape um, whatever. Yeah, less, less actively promoting safety companies where uh, there's a lot of things that go on that maybe shouldn't. Absolutely. Well, and again, one of the nicer things that, that is kind of baked into a lot of our design is um, uh, if you do it right, everything that happened is recorded. In other words, every action, trouble, fault, and log can also be something that is that is that you you get some of the best record keeping of, of, of even things like, oh, current blew out over here and that's why this sort of happened or I ran into whatever. So we're trying generally to get away from the point where you walk into the morning with your kit and there's just broken vials everywhere. Well, well what happened, right? No, there's a, there's a really clear record of like, this is the fault, this is how we present it, this is how we go through it, here's how we manage it, and here's how we, 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 we rectify those sorts of things, right? So this is, the, the, but this comes out of a culture where leveraging, you know, the instructions you're putting into a system are just as easy to put into or to, to capture on the log file side of things as a, uh, as a uh, electronic notebook. Well, and that is the sort of thing that becomes helpful. critical on an industrial scale because you can't just, you know, have a you know multi-thousand liter batch reactor fail on you uh, and yeah. not know why. Yeah, yeah. One absolutely. thing, if you have a rack of vials that got swept off the counter by your robot, but if it's a batch reactor going bad, that has a, a time and money and safety and personnel cost that's not acceptable on a large scale. It, it, and, and the big thing here that, that I advocate for is this is a this is a sort of a it's a change in muscles that the synthetic chemist has right like yeah the the, the super cool stuff we, we're we're fortunate enough to play with I, I know is sort of a, a, is a world apart from from what you kind of find out in the in the field but but so much of this comes down to look if all you have is a webcam and a script you have eyes and decision making anywhere like with a bit webcam plus a little bit of of, of script and Slack means you can take your average round bottom flask and make it email you if it starts to boil. 
right? Like I mean, and that that is hyper valuable from a perspective, especially what we've seen now with with remote work and at distance, the ability to have that kind of decision making telepresence um, in in a simple deployable. That's that's why we did that sort of the the uh, the voice to, to vision. That's that's something that it, it just takes teaching people that this is out there, right? This is, uh, this is not completely alien. It's just a different set of skills that, you know, we're taking things from consumer electronics that, that are out there. We're just pulling back into the lab. Um, on an even simpler scale, I remember back in 1995, I tried to get an instrument company in, um, interested in uh, adapting something for an organic chemist which would involve an HPLC with ability for uh, auto sampling and so that a chemist would be able to get better than a you know, TLC type of readout on multiple reactions going at the same time. Not right. 10, but even two, um, and wasn't able to get that interest. Um, you know, that sort of thing would allow a chemist to try a couple of things in parallel. And uh, I thought it would in increase the, um, throughput and, and uh, capabilities of uh, my chemists anyway. Couldn't get them Absolutely. Interested. Yeah. The no and that's, that's what got me addicted to kinetics initially, really, um, because the number of times, especially as a you know, bog standard synthetic guy, is the, oh, I mixed this together 16 hours, I'm gonna check at it. The second you do a first time course profile, you're like, wait, it's done in 30 seconds. Why am I waiting 16 hours? Mm. You know, the, 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 those number of times that seeing the evolution, watching a movie of reaction take apart, uh, again, Obi, back to how do you get students involved? Show a student a reaction unfold live and they will be forever in this field. Right? <laughs> There's nothing, nothing more, more amazing than the visualization of, of the process by which you have started. It's like watching baking, like you said before. 